Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in tonight. My name is Travis Forty. I'm an adult services librarian at the uh, Willoughby Public Library, and we're coming to you live from downtown Willoughby in mm -hmm. Lake County, Ohio. Tonight, we're going to talk to Elise Colette Goldbach about her memoir, Rust. Tonight's program is brought to you by the Lake County League of Libraries, a programming collaborative that unites all public libraries in Lake County, Ohio. Learn more at www.leagueoflibraries.org. Elise is gonna be interviewed tonight by a former colleague of mine, Jason Lee, Community Outreach Coordinator at Mentor Public Library. Tonight, I'm extremely excited to welcome Willoughby's own coming to you also from downtown Willoughby in a different location, Elise Colette Bobach. Uh, Elise is, a, is now a college professor at John Carroll University. From 2016 to 2019, she worked as a hot dipper, bander, and forklift operator at Arkeller Middle in the industrial flats. I should have learned how to say that before this event. <laughs> Uh, Rust is drawn from that experience and from the story of her life. Elise received an MFA in nonfiction from the Northeast Ohio Master of Fine Arts program. Her writings appeared in Plowshares, Western Humanities Review, Alaska Quarterly Review, McSweeney's Internet Tendency, and Best American Essays 2017. She received the Plowshares Emerging Writer Award and Walter Rumsey Marvin Grant from the Ohio Anna Library Association given to an Ohio writer uh, of promise. If you have a question for Elise during the program, and you're watching on Zoom, type it into the chat. My colleagues and I will be monitoring it and we'll ask you a question. If you're watching on Facebook Live, type your question as a comment there. Uh, without further ado, Elise Kola Goldbach. Elise, thanks for joining us tonight. Turn it over to you and Jason. Thanks so much for having me. Um, and thanks everyone for, for coming out tonight, well, or staying in tonight with us. And um, I was gonna start off tonight by giving a short reading and then Jason and I will have like a nice Q&A discussion and hopefully get some, some questions from the crowd. Um, so without further ado, I will um, give you a short reading of rest. So I wasn't supposed to be a steel worker I wasn't supposed to spend my nights looking up at the bright lights on the blast furnace, which glimmered in the starless sky. I wasn't supposed to learn the language of the mill, telling men twice my age to swing the rolls or jog the mill or clear the line. I attended an all girls Catholic high school. I ran track. I played Beth in a school rendition of Little Women and I was valedictorian of my graduating class. The possibilities are endless, adults said to me when I was young. You can do whatever you want in this world. Like a lot of kids who grow up in Cleveland, Ohio, I mostly wanted to leave. In high school, I often talked with my friends about our plans of future escape. We would travel far and wide to give ourselves culture. We would attend colleges in legitimate cities like San Francisco or Boston. The real world happened in other cities and other towns, and we wanted to build our lives somewhere, anywhere, but here. As a native born Clevelander, I had always viewed the mill as part of my landscape. It was a fixture, a backdrop, a given, much like the mountains of the Rockies or the cornfields of Iowa. And I can still remember driving past the rusty buildings on summer afternoons as a child. My father often took me on errands to pay bills or send packages or pick up groceries at the West Side Market. And we sometimes found ourselves near the orange flame that shot up from the mill's furnace. I loved every minute of these moments spent with my father. The most mundane task felt like a mission when I was sat in the passenger seat of his station wagon, which was the color of flushed skin. Together, we were Timmy and Lassie, Sandy and Flipper, Batman and Robin. We were sidekicks, comrades, kindred souls cut from the same mold. One afternoon, as the station wagon crept towards the mill in heavy traffic, my father raised a middle finger at all the idiot drivers who didn't deserve to be on the road. Learn how to merge, asshole, he said with a long honk of his horn. I tried not to listen. The man who yelled at passing cars wasn't the father I usually knew. For the most part, he was a quiet, gentle man who indulged my every whim but there was something about traffic jams that unhinged him. In those moments, it felt as if he were harboring another person inside. I cringed at every middle finger my father flicked into the air, but I fought the urge to sink into my seat and disappear. If I disappeared, then I wouldn't be a sidekick, so I did the only thing that made me feel more comfortable. 
Copying my father, I scowled at the other drivers on the road, but the traffic didn't ease despite our frustrations. With a sigh, my father turned up the car radio, which was tuned to a fuzzy AM station. Rush Limbaugh was talking about all the bad things Democrats were doing in America. I was too young to know much about the world, but I was drawn to Limbaugh's energy. He had a conviction and charisma like a preacher struck by the spirit, and I wanted to believe the things he said, even if I didn't understand them. At the very least, I grasped the crux of Limbaugh's message. Being a Republican was good and being a Democrat was not. My family believed some version of the same, except we added a heavy dose of religion into the mix. We were Republicans because God wanted us to be Republicans. Satan had corrupted the Democrats by tricking them into the sins of abortion, homosexuality, and worst of all, feminism. Now the Democrats were trying to destroy everything that was good and moral in American society, and it was our job as Republicans to oppose them. As the traffic inched forward, the station wagon drew closer to Cleveland's Industrial Valley, which was located just outside the center of the city. My father and I had driven the same stretch of highway many times before. It was one of the main arteries that wrapped around downtown Cleveland, and you could see the terminal tower and the key building looming to the north. If you look south, however, you had a bird's eye view of the Industrial Valley, which was often plagued by acrid smells. On some days, you might detect a vague odor reminiscent of decomposing fish. On other days, the scent of burnt rubber might linger in the air. On that particular afternoon, everything smelled like rotten eggs. Why does it always smell so bad around here? I asked over the sound of Rush Limbaugh's tirade. It's sulfur from the steel mill, my father told me. And which one is the steel mill, I asked. My father smoothed his mustache with fingers that had grown plump with age. As a child, I often marveled at his ring finger, which was so fat that his wedding band wouldn't budge. His flesh had grown around the gold, forming a smooth indentation in otherwise calloused skin, and he used to joke that it was a good thing Catholics didn't believe in divorce. See all those buildings in the valley, he told me. I stared down at the old rusting buildings, some of which looked close to collapse. They stretched far off into the distance, like the remnants of a forgotten city. If there hadn't been smoke swelling from the smokestacks, I would have assumed they were abandoned. Yeah, I said, I see the buildings. Well, my father told me most of them belonged to the steel mill. It's a huge place. From my view on the highway, the mill looked like a cloaked villain, both sinister and mysterious. Nothing good could possibly come from buildings so decrepit, and the smokestacks made me nervous. My grandmother smoked two packs of cigarettes a day, and everyone told her that she was going to get cancer. If something as tiny as a cigarette could make you sick, then the rotten egg chemicals that the mill was shooting into the air would surely send you to an early grave. I took a shallow breath and plugged my nose as the station wagon crawled forward. Rush Limbaugh boomed on the radio, railing against the Clintons, and I held my breath and, until my chest burned. I clenched my fists and wiggled in my seat, taking tiny gulps of air that were just big enough to keep me from passing. Like my grandmother's cigarettes, the mill belonged to a past I couldn't quite fathom at the time. It was the dividing line between the generations who had built America and the ones who would inherit it next. The word millennial hadn't yet entered my vocabulary as I held my breath past the mill, but I already understood that my generation yeah, had been promised a better huh? future than the ones contained in the of Cleveland's Left industrial habit. house. We weren't supposed to settle for the trivial it. jobs that would provide yeah. us nothing more than a paycheck, and adults encouraged us to provide so, to yeah. pursue yeah. something more than the drudgery of blue collar work. If you can dream it, you can do it, they said. The world is your oyster. As a child, I took the catchphrases and cliches to heart. The rust covered building smelled of rot, not opportunity, so I stubbornly held my breath as my father honked his horn. I didn't care how long it took us to move through the traffic. And I didn't care how badly my body wanted air. I was going to hold my breath as long as I could because I didn't want the ugliness of the mill inside me. So with that, I will turn it over to Jason. All right. I, I want to lead with an apology. I'm going to commit a cardinal error for an interview and I'm going to ask the hardest question first. Because you talk a lot of big topics in the book and we're going to get to as many of them as you feel comfortable with. But I need to ask, you talk about Star Trek repeatedly in Rust. So who is your favorite Star Trek captain and why is it Cisco? And you, my husband would love you because he loves Cisco. I like Captain Janeway. Uh, so okay, no, no, yeah, no. Uh, grew up on Voyager, so. <laughs> Voyager is right, it's, it's underappreciated. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, so the steel mill almost has a mythical status in Cleveland and other belt cities. It's often invoked, but it's less often experienced or understood. So what do most people get wrong about the mills? Um, well, I think that 
what I didn't understand, at least when I first went in there, was um, the 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 force that the union plays, like, and how it creates this really huge sense of community, um, and that that like really like being a steel worker is being part of a family and it becomes really a part of your identity. And, you know, I think that, that people see um, like mill workers and, and auto workers like fighting for their jobs and they assume that it's only about economics. But I think it's also about that identity that, that that's created when you're part of that family, I would say. There's a line that I like to steal from a friend of mine who served in the Marines. Uh, he said, there's no such thing as an ex-Marine. Is it fair to say there's no such thing as an ex steel mill worker? Like you're still a steel mill worker in addition to being many other things? I, I certainly feel that way. Um, you know, I was just talking to people from the mill today earlier this afternoon. And, 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 you know, even now I still kind of like daydream about driving a tow motor or working a crane or so. So I think that it's still like kind of inside of me for sure. Now the mill as you describe it uh, can be insular it can even be a little cliquish. Now, fortunately, you work in academia now where it's never insular or cliquish. <laughs> uh, what else, if anything, do the mill and academia have in common? Um, you know, I, I would say that there are places that both make you think, I guess, in different ways. Um, you know, I mean, obviously academia makes you think and, and kind of challenges you to, um, you know, create and, and do that kind of stuff. But I think like being in the mill, um, people don't realize like how much thought goes into kind of keeping yourself safe, keeping, you know, um, making sure that the products are produced right, making sure that, you know, everything is, uh, yeah, that, that you're aware of your surroundings at all times, I would say. And um, also, I, I, strangely, when I was working in the mill, I had a lot of conversations, especially political conversations that, you know, would would make me think and challenge me to, to do my own research. And so strangely, it also kind of, yeah, sparked that research vein in me too. What do you miss most about working in the mill? I definitely the friendships that I, I made and, and just, you know, hanging out kind of went on our breaks, um, you know, and, and talking or doing crossword puzzles and, um, and, and just getting to know the people. I also really miss the atmosphere as well. Um, there was something really breathtaking about kind of driving down this big hill into the valley and there's just these huge billowing buildings and, you know, the smokestacks and everything. And, and when you looked at it from below, it, it kind of just inspired awe in you, you know? And, and, and there were, there were times when I would like just kind of go off and get lost in the mill and like explore the little nooks and crannies and, and, you know, see, see what, what it had to offer and kind of look what secrets it had. It would be a remarkable place to tour. It's just, you know, you don't want to get in the way of people who are moving several tons of, you know, often very hot metal. Yeah. 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 That's why you, you only do that when you really know the landscape. But yeah. Okay. Now, I don't want to only ask about the mill itself, because don't get me wrong, the mill is important in your memoir, in your story, but it's also a framing mechanism to discuss some huge, huge issues. So we're going to do our best to go through them one at a time, but they're all pretty huge. So you talk about sexual assault in the book and your own experience. Um, what was your reaction when you first started seeing the Me Too hashtag? Um, you know, I think that I, I wished that it had been around when I was 18 years old and, and just to have those, you know, I think just knowing other women who have gone through similar things and knowing those stories, I think it, it can give you hope. I think it can also um, help you to, to speak out about your own, you know, instance of, of sexual violence. Um, you know, even like in, in this whole Me Too era, um, more stories from that college have come out of, of other women who had experiences similar to mine. And for years, I never knew that, that this was kind of a, a ongoing problem at that campus. And I think I, I would have felt more of a sense of community, I think, had I known that those other women existed and, and been able to connect with them. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy that, that this movement is, I'm, I'm unfor it's unfortunate that we need this movement, but I, I, I think it's, it's good, it's a positive direction. For now, sure. yeah. I, when you were assaulted at college, you told your story then, 
you told your story now. Does it ever get easier or does it hurt every time to tell it? Yeah, it definitely hurts every time. I would say it hurts less than those first couple times when I was telling it to the college administrators and things like that. But, but, you know, even in the writing of Rust, all these years later, um, you know, that was the one section where I would just procrastinate. Like I didn't want to, you know, get into it. I, you know, um, just because it, 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 it dredges up all those emotions and, and makes them kind of just as real as they were. I mean, your memoir presses a lot of raw nerves. Like it, it, it's running over raw nerves like Ray Charles on a keyboard. Um, you argue about, or you talk, you write about arguing about politics with your loved ones, uh, your relationship with religion, sexual assault, and your own mental health. Um, concentrating on any of these topics, let alone all of them, can be stressful. And to to talk about mental health, stress can be a trigger for mixed episodes, as you mentioned in the book. Um, did you have any concern about how writing your story and excavating your own life might affect your mental health? Um, yes, but I would say that my experience has been, it's overall writing has kind of been a, a positive effect on my mental health. I think because it makes you um, question yourself, your motives, your history, you know, and, and you kind of have to sit and think, with, think about yourself for, for hours and hours on end. And so I think it helps you, or at least it helps me process those kind of different emotions. Um, and, you know, luckily, like in the writing of this book, I was um, pretty stable and, and had a good support system. So that also kind of helped to keep me grounded as well. Um, but because it, it was, a, it was stressful writing about all of it and, you know, working on deadlines and all of that stuff is also another stress and, um, but, but yeah, it, luckily with my support systems, I was able to kind of keep myself from, from going off the deep end in the writing of it. Now, you do an impressive job writing objectively about mixed episodes. And I keep saying mixed episodes. I, I should probably try to define that, but I bet you you could do it better than me. <laughs> um, so if you could say, wh explain what a mixed episode is, and then is it hard to objectively write about a situation like that, knowing that in the moment, there's no way to be objective? Yeah, so a mixed episode is um, a characteristic of bipolar disorder in some people. And so we usually think of bipolar disorder as having like a depressive episode, maybe followed by a manic episode. So, you know, you're, you're sad and then you're totally um, kind of full of energy and, and maybe a little bit delusional. And a mixed episode basically combines those two where you'll have symptoms of depression, like sadness and lethargy and fatigue. Um, but then you'll also kind of have like a racing mind and, and kind of have all that energy that kind of can't get out. Um, and so it, it, it is a very uncomfortable state to be in because it's two extremes kind of clashing together. Um, and for me, it, it, it is very hard. And I would say that it's most difficult to write about those episodes or those times in my life. Um, just because it's painful for me to look back and see, um, kind of try and be objective about who I was at that time. Um, and, and some of it helps, you know, in the writing, like uh, talking to other people and, and getting their perspective on, on how that, you know, event took place and, and what their perception of it was that can be really helpful in, in helping me get that objective eye. Um, and, and, usually those scenes kind of take a couple drafts to get right, to get that emotion that I was feeling down um, in the most honest way possible, at least. Absolutely. Now, there have been a series of memoirs that have captured attention, uh, written about flyover country, uh, Hillbilly Elegy, Educated, uh, Cassie Chambers, Hill Women. Uh, did you did you intentionally see Rust fitting in there, or did you just tell your story? Um, I think it was a little bit of both. Um, I mostly wanted to write about the mill because of the people and my experience, and also I felt like it was a really unique perspective, um, you know, that was going on around the election and with Trump and and everything. And so, like, I really just wanted to tell that story along with my own kind of personal history. Um, but then kind of in, in putting it together, I also saw how it was kind of playing off these other books as well. Um, 
I, I imagine you've probably read a lot of memoirs in the last few, well, I, I'm going to say years, but decades, because I mean, you've always been writing. Um, are, are there any in particular that you would recommend to the people who are watching right now? Besides, of course, your own. Here, let me recommend it for you so you don't have to. Read Rust. It's a good book. Love yeah, it from the yeah. library. If you love it, buy it afterward. Um, I mean, I did. I have to say I did love Educated and I read it in the steel mill. So that was a great one um, more recently. Um, I also I love um, Notes from No Man's Land by Eula Biss um, and the Empathy Exams um, by Leslie Jameson, um, which are both essay collections because I do. I love the essay, but are also, you know, memoristic essays. So those are three off the top of my head. Yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned empathy. We're going we're to circle back to this theme. We're going to circle back. Now, you mentioned earlier that you're still in touch with some coworkers from the mill. Have they given you any reaction to the memoir? Did they like seeing themselves? Are they mad at you? I haven't heard anyone who's mad at me, but maybe that's because they aren't talking to me anymore. I don't know. Um, but no, I think that the overall reaction was positive. And I think people were excited to see, you know, because they, they knew all along that I was trying to be a writer and, and wanted to to write this book. And so I think it was exciting for them to see that happen. Yeah. Um, and, it, and there were a few readings actually that I did before everything closed down for COVID and some steel workers came to one. And so that was kind of fun. They got to ask me questions and get to talk about like, you know, the steel making process and, and kind of, you know, they, they asked me some questions that tested my knowledge to, to make sure I was a real, the real deal. That's going to be more an insightful interlocution than you, you're getting right now. Uh, you, you mentioned one coworker in particular, and I can tell you wrote about her well, because I wanted to know what happened to her afterward. Um, and you're going to have to forgive me in the moment I've forgotten her name. She was the other female trainee who was with you on that first day. And you mentioned, you know, she, she eventually ended up not surviving, uh, not, not lasting with a steel mill, uh, through that early period, I'd be fascinated to hear like what happens next there because you did such a wonderful job of telling the beginning of the story. Oh yeah, and um, I I don't know what happened to her after she lost her job, unfortunately. And and the way I found out, like the mill is just you know there's just the rumors that go around. So you know you I don't even really know the whole situation of of how she lost her job, but it was yeah um, the, yeah very unfortunate and. Um, I think that maybe she kind of got the short end of the stick in her, her situation, from what I could tell. So really important question with Thanksgiving coming up. For those who actually are eating with their families and daring to discuss politics during it, uh, you discuss the difference between your own and your parents' political opinions and, and how that temporarily strained your relationship in 2016. I don't know if this is a less contentious presidential election than 2016. Do you and your family just avoid the topic now? And if not, is there any difference between now and 2016 and how you and your family discuss it? I would say I've noticed this in, in a lot of the Trump supporters I know is, is it feels like people have kind of almost dug their feet in with their support of Trump and it's almost even more more intense than it was in 2016. Um, and, and so I would say we kind of avoided a little bit more than usual because there is that kind of contentiousness. Um, but, but we still do do talk. And, um, you know, I think that I, I always try and arm myself with as many like facts as possible and as much information as possible. Um, so that I kind of always am able to, to, you know, just deliver an answer right back um, as much as I can. And, it, but it's it's hard and it's hard when you know yeah um some some things don't feel like they're some things feel like they're very much divorced from reality some opinions and it's hard to argue i think with those along the same lines but i promise not on the exact same line you retell a lot of disagreements in rust uh disagreements about politics religion civic pride uh you argue with your parents uh, your boyfriend at the time, co-workers, those two attorneys from D.C. And, and in pretty much every instance, you try to take the other person's perspective into account. It's not just about lambasting the other person for thinking differently. So one, 
how difficult was it to exercise empathy with some of these individuals? Not necessarily your parents who you're going to love for all time, but say two condescending attorneys from DC. Like why, why is empathy important to you and how do you exercise it? Yeah, no, I think that it, it's it's harder with those instances where you're not like personally invested in someone to, to kind of show them empathy. Um, and And it's, but I feel like, I can't write just from that one perspective of, of just kind of being angry at somebody or, or anger or rage. And I think that when writing does that um, and focuses on that kind of anger or that one dimension, one dimensionality, it, it, it kind of falls flat. And so it's I like think reading that, an ulcer. Yeah, exactly. After a while <laughs> That's a great description. Um, and so I think that, that, part of my doing that is, is in service of the writing itself. Um, and, and then that also kind of, I think helps me maybe as a person as well, because I'm forced to kind of think of things from other people's perspective. Um, but I think that it's, it's just something I've, I think because I've had so many difficulties for, with the sexual assault, with mental illness, with um, all these instances where I, I needed someone to empathize with me, I think that I, it makes me more likely to empathize with others. I would say. That's remarkable that like some of the hardest situations in your life made you more empathetic because when people go through tragedy and, and I want to delineate here between tragedy and sadness, everybody experiences sadness. I don't know if everybody experiences tragedy, but when you go through tragedy, you really only have two options. You come through harder, you come through more cynical or you come through softer. And I think it's a lot harder to come out softer. So kudos to you for, for doing that work. Thank you, uh, thank you, yeah. There, there were some cynical moments in there, but yeah, we got over them. <laughs> there's cynical moments at breakfast, it happens. Just don't, yeah, yeah. You, can't, you can't live in the mo that moment. All right, so weird question, weird question, nitpicky question. Okay, so the Plain Dealer published some photos of you when they reviewed Rust. And at first I assumed they were new photos. But then I noticed they were snapped in 2017. If you don't mind me asking, why was Gus Chan taking pictures of you in 2017? Um, it was actually um, started, I, I was like a hiker. I would used to do backpacking. And mm -hmm. so I met um, Grant Segal, who, who, who did the, um, the, does like the life in Cleveland um, things. And, and he wanted, he was, you know, we got to talking about how he was a writer, but also a steel worker. And so he was interested in kind of doing that like little focus piece on me and doing a little interview. So yeah, it was just kind of a, a random thing, but, but very appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> it, it worked out great. They had the file photos ready to go. I have to level with you. I'm a little embarrassed. I know Grant, I've been pronouncing his last name Siegel for the last decade. And so no, yeah. you're probably getting it right. Cause I've never like, actually it's, it's like what we were talking about earlier. Sometimes you, <laughs> when you learn mostly from reading, you know how to spell it, not how to pronounce it. And Grant's too nice to tell you you're getting it wrong anyhow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So without spoiling anything, you talk ab about the nearly sacredness of the mill. And you discuss the iconic flame uh, from the basic oxygen furnace in almost Zoroastrian terms. Um, I'm curious, because you went through a crisis of faith. Uh, what is your relationship with religion today? Um, it's still very complicated. Um, I did, I went through a period after the sexual assault, um, which happened at a college, a Catholic campus. And I felt like very abandoned by the church. So after that, I was very, um, anti-religion just steered away from kind of everything. Um, in recent years, I've come back to the Catholic Church, but in a much more, um, in a much different way. I'm not, it used to be very enmeshed in like what they wanted me to believe. And I, I think I, I like to think that I think for myself a little bit more now. Um, and I'm also interested in like meditation and Buddhism and, and how those, that kind of Eastern philosophy can also support um, you know, the, that little Christian kind of thing. So, so I had a little mix of things. Yeah. That's what Thomas Merton was all about too. There's, there's some uh, good Catholic literature on that topic. Uh, so some questions from the crowd, what made you decide to work in a steel mill? Um, it was totally um, money <laughs> was the, the big one. Yeah. Um, I, I was having trouble finding a job after college. Um, you know, I didn't have health insurance. 
one of my friends happened to work at the steel mill and was like, oh, you should apply, you should apply. And I was like, I'm not a steel worker. Um, and then he showed me his paycheck and I was like, oh, I could be a steel worker. And so, um, so yeah, it was totally practical reasons. Um, and, and I was, I, I did not understand what steel working entailed at all. You know, the, the shift work, the, the, the enormous size of the machines. So I was a little like a deer in the headlights at first, but I got used to it. <laughs> Now, was it a difficult job to get? Um, yes, very difficult. <laughs> um, it was, I actually um, had a, a pretty short process. It took about four months of like all these different tests, you know, like physical tests of like feats of strength they made us do, like also like, you know, intellectual tests, personality tests, drug tests, you know, um, kind of all of these screening processes that they went through. And, um, and, and so it took me four months, but some people it takes like two or three years, um, you know, they're, they're kind of like in a pool, just kind of waiting to get hired. Um, and so, and it's very, you know, thousands of people apply for a few spots. So it's very competitive. Yeah. Would you recommend working in the steel mill to other young people? I actually would, um, you know, despite, I mean, I would, with the disclaimer, of course, it's a dangerous job. Of course, you know, there, there's always a risk um, to yourself and, and sometimes the shift work can be really difficult. But I mean, it's, it's a union job, it's great pay, it's great benefits. It's, you know, a pension in a time when pensions no longer exist. It's, um, you know, and, and there's also, the union provides a lot of safety support as well to make the environment a little bit, a little bit better, a little bit safer. Um, and and so overall, I would I would encourage everyone, you know, to to apply. <laughs> yeah. uh, one of one of our listeners wants to know if you use pseudonyms for your coworkers or if you use their real names, and if so, do they want compensation? Oh, um, I did use pseudonyms. Um, yeah, the the nicknames are authentic, but um, the if, if I use someone's real name, I changed it. Yeah. I mean, how um, long does it take to get a nickname in the steel mill? Um, it depends on who you are. Pretty much not very long. Yeah. <laughs> um, another reader would like to know, did your mental health affect your work at the mill? Um, yes. And, and the mill kind of affected my mental health. Um, you know, on the bright side, the mill kind of gave me health insurance. So I was able to get access to, to better doctors, better therapists, things like that. Um, but the mill, like there's a lot of swing shifts and night work that happen. And when you have bipolar disorder, um, kind of a lack of sleep is like a, a huge red flag. It's a, you know, a trigger for, for those kinds of mixed episodes we were talking about. Um, and so uh, eventually I did kind of fall into one of those mixed episodes and, and had to be hospitalized in the psych ward and, and take some time off work. Um, and it was when I was able to switch into a different department that allowed me to kind of just work a day shift. And then, then I, then everything was fine. It was just those shifts that were really hard on, on the mind. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, oh. Uh, and a, a follow-up question to that. Uh, when did you first know that you would benefit from help with your mental health issues? And uh, I'll add that that's in the book. That's in the book. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, it was really, I mean, I think the, the moment when I kind of realized that I, I needed to be more serious about my, my mental health care um, was after that episode, um, just because it was so, I had been in the same place again and again, like having the suicidal ideation and being in psych wards and out of psych wards. Um, and, and I had always gone off the medications or kind of not taken it super seriously, especially in my early 20s. Um, and I, I kind of just was sick of that cycle and I needed it to stop. And so, you know, I was able to connect with, with a good psychiatrist and a good medication. And finally, you know, cause, um, people with bipolar disorder, they can cycle through tons of medications, um, before they find the right one. This may be your first book, but you've been writing for a long time, a long time and working on your writing career for a long time. So I want to know personally, how did it feel when you saw that review in the New York Times? Oh, that was, 
yeah um you know it made my like stomach drop a little bit i would say but it, strangely the, the the part that was more affecting to me was when i i got the book deal like that was like the mo- you know like you know i i mean i think i was working night shift at the steel mill trying to learn how to run a crane and i was just so exhausted but it just you know filled me with elation you know um i mean to work so hard and for you know practically a decade trying to get there yeah Absolutely. And I had to say, as someone who has had a warehouse job, your tow motor fears are well based. They're like, I, I have a former coworker who's probably down a toe because of me. So I completely understand where you're coming from. And if Bart, you're listening, I'm sorry. Um, I, I think we make a mistake when we refer to the American dream as a singular thing. I think a lot of different people have different American dreams. And I think you discuss a lot of different people's American dreams in Rust. But I want to know, what's your American dream? Um, gosh, I mean, I think being able to, to work hard, get an education without getting in, into horrible debts. Um, I think also just a world in which we're not so divisive and where everyone has truly equal opportunity, not the fake equal opportunity that everyone has now. Um, And, and just, yeah, I think being able to kind of follow your passions and and having the opportunity to do so, I think would be my American dream. Um, Not necessarily, you know, the white picket fence, but I think, I think we all have our things that we want to want to do or want to accomplish. And I think, yeah, having the ability to do so is, is part of it. A few more questions from the audience. They're they're asking good questions. Yeah, you should yeah. have gotten them instead of me, Travis. <laughs> um, have any of your students read your memoir? And if so, what impressions did they share with you? And that's I'm not sure that anyone has read the memoir, or if they have, they haven't told me. Um, I have shared like some of my own writing um, in class, some other writings in class with students, um, and I think that that's fun for them to see, like. The generation of projects and and how things kind of come together and you know I shared some new work with them and and, and that related to to work that they were doing so I think that they got some hopefully in, inspiration from things yeah now I'm going to read both the comment and the question from from this listener because I the the two coincide um, I greatly admire your scrappiness and ability to do such a difficult job but also your flexibility and intellect in your academic achievements. How does the span of your experiences color your understanding of our current political division? Man, um, well, I feel like I've seen, yeah, two kind of very different worlds, obviously. And um, I'm fearful for this election, I guess, Um, you know, and fearful of where the country is headed, um, just, from, from things I've seen and heard from, from people down in the mills. Um, I'm also though, you know, in my talking to people from the mills, you know, we would talk politics and it was always kind of comforting because we would, you know, get in these horrible debates and then we would go out and be steel workers together and, and, and kind of be able to still find that common ground. So I still, still have hope for, for the country, but, but I'm, I'm fearful if we don't turn things around quickly, then we're, you know, might get in over our heads. Another listener who has clearly read the book because she's asking a deep cut question here, but it's a good question and I'm curious too. Hey, when, when you were sexually assaulted, there was a trial of sorts to see if one of the two people involved should be expelled from the school. Am I, am I, am I framing that correctly? Oh. Yeah. And in this instance, you were allowed to have one witness and that one witness was a friend of yours and she chose to use air quotes around the word friend. I'm comfortable with that phrasing too. Um, I, I don't think it spoils the book to say that the friend was not as supportive of you as she could have been under the circumstance. And both the, the listener and myself would like to know if that friend has ever gotten in touch with you to apologize for what she put you through that day? No, she hasn't. Or um, if, if she has tried, I'm, I'm not aware of it. Um, and I, I would welcome an apology, um, but I don't know that that's ever gonna come. Yeah. 
you you never know where someone else's heart is at. You know? That's true. Yeah. You, you try to give them the credit benefit of the doubt, but sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> All right. So you thank David Giffels uh, effusively in your acknowledgments. Um, I, I would like to know that because it, it's such an effusive thank you that I feel like there's a backstory there. I would like to know in what way he's been helpful and supportive to you. Yeah, so um, I, I graduated from the Northeast Ohio Master of Fine Arts program, which, and David teaches um, in that program. So he was my thesis director in grad school. Um, we actually like, I started grad school and he started teaching the same semester. Um, so like, we've just, you know, he's been um, really great in giving feedback to my work and also just kind of helping foster me through hard times. And, and so, yeah, he's been very instrumental to the whole process. And yeah, I'm eternally grateful <laughs> to David Giffels. Wonderful, wonderful. So uh, another question from the group and presumably somebody with a doctorate in psychiatry, because this is a heck of a question. Do you consciously choose risky endeavors like cliff climbing and mill work as a death wish or for the challenge? I think, well, I hope it's not for the death wish or maybe I need some more therapy, I don't know. I think I do like the challenge of, of things like that. Um, just, yeah, kind of pushing myself to that limit. And I think that's why I like writing too, because it's not easy, you know, or at least it doesn't come easily to me. Um, and, and so just kind of always having that, that next project to, to conquer, I guess, is, is kind of part of my, yeah, curse or, or psyche or whatever. Um, yeah. <laughs> Okay, now cor correct my correct my mill language here. It, one of the jobs that you considered doing was stirring the 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 dreg, stirring the the drek? The the um the, the pots, yeah the yeah 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 that, yeah. What is and in the book you explain how physically exhausting it is. What's more exhausting, stirring the drek or writing? Um, stirring. <laughs> <laughs> stirring, yeah. <laughs> that's that's a great answer because there's, there's a million writers like writing is the most exhausting thing you could do, and there's a million still mills there chuckling, like they're like, yeah, they're like, yeah, you, you don't even know, yeah, no, yeah. like staring down at that and being like, man, if I fall in that, I'm toast. <laughs> that's yeah, that's more exhausting. Uh, you mention in the book, and you're gonna have to pardon me here. I'm spoiling a little something because it's the, the wording of the question. Uh, your boyfriend at the time, now your husband. Congratulations. Um, is a teacher. Uh, somebody was curious what he teaches. Oh, he teaches English also. So there were two English buffs. Yeah. <laughs> Couple questions that I always ask. I always ask, um, what have you been reading lately that you loved? Well, actually, I'm I'm still um, reading David Giffel's book. Um, yeah. <laughs> about Ohio. Uh, Barnstorming? Barnstorming, Ohio. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I'm loving it. And so, yeah, definitely go out. Excellent. By that, yeah. Okay, somebody actually typed in here, how's Tony? I don't know what that means, but how's Tony? <laughs> oh, he's good. Tony that's, good. That's my husband, yeah. <laughs> oh, Tony's good. Good, good, yeah. Tony. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Is there anything else that you'd like to add? No, I don't, I don't think so. You've been a great host and a great moderator. Oh, this, this, this crowd is doing all the hard lifting, please. <laughs> like, I'm very grateful to you, but I'm also really grateful to them. These guys are great. A um, couple more questions from this. Uh, one, they wanna know what you're writing next. I don't know yet. I'm working on, on two different things that are kind of related. Um, one is a very like experimental piece. Like I like experimental writing. Um, that's almost kind of bordering on poetry. I would call it like a collage memoir, I guess. Oh, the po um, the prose poems. So yeah, something like that. Um, the carafe half blind. Yeah, and the other one is um, a memoir uh, that's kind of about, I, I have this fascination with um, conspiracy theories. And <laughs> and so it's, it's kind of a memoir about that, but also about like, the way we remember and the way we process grief and things like that. So they're still very both unformed. So we don't know what's gonna happen with them. We have one more question in the inbox. Um, somebody would like to know, how do you work up the courage to put your genuine self out to the world in your writing? It is obviously a very vulnerable process and I would find that very challenging. Yeah, it, it definitely is. And I, I do have to admit, I. 
I never think about the fact that other people are going to read things when I'm writing them. I just kind of like write them the way I feel they need to be written. And then, then I just like keep going like along this process of, you know, trying to get things published. And then um, like when Rust finally came out, I kind of had a little panic moment where I'm like, oh my gosh, people are going to read this. <laughs> um, so, so I would say like, I think that, yeah, I'm just kind of always in service of the art. And then I realize later that, that I'm putting it out there. <laughs> Uh, one more question has come in. Do you have any nun friends, either from your time at the Catholic school, um, Franciscan, or just in general? Nun no, friends. I don't have any nun friends that I keep in touch with. Um, you know, going to Catholic high school, there were um, some nuns there that, that made a, a huge impression on me, but I don't know anyone like, you know, close in my life right now. Wonderful. I can't thank you enough for your time. Uh, this has been delightful. And, and I do want to thank this crowd one more time. You guys have been great. You guys have been wonderful. Well-read, insightful crowd, too. So thank you. Uh, Travis, do you have anything more you'd like to add? Nothing more for me. Thank you very much, Elise. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank, thanks, everyone, for coming and, and the great questions. <laughs> And thank you guys for, for having me and, and asking. And yeah, it's been a fun evening.